Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, this is our first um, cyber seminar that we've put on in a, um, a Zoom environment, which is great because normally we feel like we've got a great group of people coming um, when we get you know uh, 50 people in a room for lunch. Um, today we're sitting with 160 um, customers that are joining us today. And uh, I welcome you all. I think it's fabulous. Thanks for joining us. And this may be a better format uh, for us in order to be able to deliver some of the information that we have to keep us all secure. Um, I'm not going to take the wind out of Mark's and Dane's sales relative to some of the giant hacks that have occurred recently and the problems that have occurred. But certainly, we all do not want to be a part um, of that individually or um, socially from um, an economic front. Um, today, what we have is uh, uh, many of you may have not have met uh, myself. I'm Chris Olson. I'm the Chief Operating and Chief Risk Officer for Fremont Bank. Um, and uh, I'm bringing to you today um, Mark Rose Osley, who's our Chief Information Security Officer. Uh, Mark joined the bank um, about nine years ago. Um, I went out looking for an information security person and um, I was lucky to get Mark. It was based on promising him a really good lunch um, when I hired him, uh, well, made him the offer. And so I brought him over and for some reason, um, our uh, facility, we had some remodeling going on and um, couldn't get to the restaurants that were close by to our Fremont hub, hub headquarters. So we met at one of our branches. I won't met, mention which branch, but um, literally my uh, welcome lunch and offer time for Mark Rosasley was a McDonald's Happy Meal. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so it goes to show you that uh, Mark looked past the lunch um, at uh, Fremont Bank and the opportunity here. Um, Mark is a tremendous security professional. He sits as a, an advisor on Homeland Security. He's in many networks throughout the country. Um, keeping an eye on cybersecurity. Um, he's been the sole responsible individual for developing the plan that we have at Fremont Bank. Uh, again, nine years ago, we had one person monitoring cybersecurity in the bank. And Mark will tell you um, how he's built that staff today. Um, but a very professional group. Um, he really knows what he's doing. He's written the uh, really all-encompassing guide. It's a reference guide for um, IT and InfoSec. Um, it's in there. You can find things like, uh, you know, what DDoS stands for, you know, what, uh, you know, um, WW stands for, um, what a kill chain is. I mean, everything is in there very easy to figure out. And, and Mark, I think, is in his third edition of that book. Um, if you go out and buy it, I think he makes 49 cents per copy. So it's not going to get rich quick campaign for Mark. <laughs> That's about right. But um, <laughs> with enough said for me, I want to get to the, the meat of this. We have a great uh, other presenter, or professional. Uh, Dane is going to be taking, uh, taking us through the PowerPoint. So um, I'm going to let the um, show begin. And Mark, it's all yours. Again, everyone, thanks for coming. You're important to Fremont Bank. You are our key customers and we appreciate the relationship. So Mark, it's yours. Yes, thank you, Chris. Uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, the reason we're doing this today is to uh, to help you, if we can, provide you with some uh, information that you may find useful. So thank you, thank you for joining us today. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, if you've been to one of these seminars before, you've been to it in person, because that's what we've been doing for the past several years. But uh, uh, this year we're doing Zoom. There are so many more people who have joined us this year. Uh, I think we're gonna continue doing it on Zoom because I think it's just more convenient for everybody. So I'll introduce myself briefly. I'm Mark rhodes Owsley. Uh, as Chris said, I've been with the bank nine years. Uh, I, I've, been doing, I've been doing cybersecurity for, uh, oh, since 1994. How long is that? Uh, long time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, 27 uh, years, Mark. Yeah, 27 years. And so I've, I've worked at a lot of places. I've seen a lot of things. I've written a couple of books, as Chris mentioned. Um, and uh, I joined the bank because I really enjoy being part of uh, an organization, a company that uh, is so focused on helping the community. 
uh, that's really what we do in cybersecurity is try to try to uh, stop these uh, these scammers and hackers, these bad guys. Um, so uh, uh, today, our first speaker today is going to be Dane Boyd. Dane is a friend of the bank. He doesn't work he doesn't work for Fremont Bank. He's a business partner uh, who's helped us with many many of uh, various seminars and training sessions. Uh, Dane is a expert in social engineering which is a key point that we want to cover with you today. We want to show you all of the, uh, the current kinds of social engineering tricks and scams that we're seeing uh, today. So you can be on the lookout for them, as well as tell you what we at the bank are doing to protect you as our client and uh, what you can do to protect yourself. So uh, uh, we'll start with Dane and uh, he'll talk about some of the threats that are out there and then I'll come back and talk about uh, some of the things that uh, that we do and that you can do to protect yourself. So uh, thank you, Dane. Please go ahead and take it away. Awesome, thank you. I'm just gonna get my screen shared here. Give me one second. Michelle, if you can help me out, that'd be fantastic. All right. All right, we're all set. Hey, um, great to be with you today. I, I will say, as someone who lives out on the East Coast, I definitely enjoy my trips out to California to visit with the Fremont team and, and the Fremont's customers. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to, to be with you all today remote, but uh, also do hope, forward, uh, hope to be able to come back and visit in person again soon. So uh, today during our cybersecurity event, we're going to talk a lot about some of the uh, threats that, uh, that your organization faces. Um, and so we've, we've got an agenda. We're going to touch lightly on some of today's cyber uh, cyber attacks and cyber landscapes. We're going to talk about social engineering in a little bit of depth. We're talk about some real world attacks, and then we're going to talk about some defensive tactics that you can uh, take yourself in order to defend against these type of attacks. And now I'll turn it back over to Mark, where he will cover some of the Fremont Bank initiatives as well. Um, so you know, I actually I live in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta. And so when the Colonial Pipeline was shut down, uh, I was directly impacted by it. It was an interesting feeling to know that um, the cybersecurity of one organization impacted the lives of millions of people. And driving around and seeing gas stations that were shut down, um, seeing cars that were left parked there waiting for that next fuel truck, um, and hearing people uh, talk about driving for you know, 10, 20, 30 miles just to get uh, a few gallons of gas so they could get their child from uh, daycare. It was an interesting experience, and all of this was because was from lax security. Now we know a little bit more now than we uh, did originally. Uh, it, it turns out that this attack was actually started uh, by credentials that were uh, still accessible for an account that had been that should have been deprovisioned on the on the Colonial Bank, or excuse me, the Colonial Pipeline network. And it's interesting to see that such a minor mistake, this minor oversight, had direct implications on the customers and the economy. Uh, likewise, as someone who loves meat and bacon and things of that nature, I also was deeply impacted by the JBS breach. Um, now, JBS actually uh, in, in, uh, introduced a more or, or made visible a more um, devious tactic to ransomware, right? So both the Colonial Pipeline as well as the JBS attack were ransomware attacks. So we know ransomware encrypts files, makes them inaccessible to the owners of the organizations, uh, and then ransoms access back to it. Well, they've actually added some additional uh, extortion tactics. So not only are they threatening to uh, dismantle or remove or delete the data if they don't pay up, but then they also um, extort them to say, well, if you don't release the data, then we're gonna start releasing data to uh, your customers, to your partners. Uh, and, and, and that way, further blackmailing them in order to get paid. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, J both JBS as well as Colonial Pipeline did pay, um, and, you know, pay the ransom and were able to get their operations back up, but of course it costs them millions of dollars uh, and also of course hurt their brand. Uh, now organizations, depending on their size uh, and their, their presence may be able to weather a storm uh, like this and the, the, the implications that it would have. But you know, this is one thing that you should ask yourself, is this something that your organization could withstand? It's always better of course to prevent these types of attacks and the best way to prevent them is by understanding them. Now, not all cases, but many cases uh, where cyber, uh, cyber attacks happen, uh, it all starts with social engineering. So social engineering is a pretty interesting science uh, that uh, it basically takes advantage of human nature. So social engineering definition, I've found a lot of them. Uh, I, I like this simple definition, it basically says that social engineering is exploiting human nature. 
influence someone to taking action that may not be in their best interest. And those emotions that it takes advantage of can be anything from greed, curiosity, trust, fear, and others. So I want to go through a couple examples of where we see these emotions being exploited by cyber criminals. Um, so with greed, you know, you, you've probably all seen the 419 uh, Nigerian print scam where you get an email and you're offered tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars from a disaffected prince who needs to get money out of the country. Um, and to many of us, we would all agree that this type of attack can't happen to us, but it does prey on greed. Uh, and there are people who do fall for this. Um, there was a person who came and spoke to at a conference in Australia, security conference in Australia, and they admitted that they actually lost over, a, I believe, a two-year two-year period uh, that they lost um, three hundred thousand dollars. Four, excuse me, four-year period lost three hundred thousand dollars. Now, I personally, a, a father of one of my friends uh, revealed to me recently that their father actually fell for this and actually lost ten thousand dollars. And so, while we might think to to some of us who are more sophisticated and work in the space that these type of attacks can't work, they continue because they do, uh, and all of them play off the emotion of greed, that human nature. Uh, curiosity, uh, you know, they always say curiosity kills the cat, and cyber criminals uh, don't hesitate to use curiosity. Um, several years ago, when the Malaysian Flight 370 disappeared, uh, there was a spike in uh, phishing attacks that actually exploited information about that, saying that this flight had been found, or saying they had revealed video, or other information to get people wondering what was on the other side of that link, and would get them to click links and bring them to fake websites uh, in order to download malicious software to the computer. And kind of tied to the idea of curiosity in, in a more, uh, I guess, more recent example, we also see this emotion of fear being played with COVID-19. And many of you likely uh, saw spikes in COVID-19 related phishing emails. And we see that the cyber criminals were using this lack of information or were offering exclusive information, uh, access to cures, uh, you know, communication from government authorities, et cetera. Um, and, and people's fears about the unstable economies, the lack of goods, things of that nature, to actually get people to engage in malicious emails, uh, all at their own peril. Another example of where some of the motions was taking, uh, taking advantage of them, this time not by a cyber criminal, but just by a criminal, uh, a man who pretended to be a doctor in Pakistan uh, actually did surgery at a hospital on an on a elderly woman uh, who eventually expired from the, 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 the harm and the illness that she had. In fact, not only did he perform surgery on this elderly woman, he actually went to her house, make house calls, change bandages, and reportedly had done it to several other people. Uh, and all because he took advantage of uh, their trust. He, 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 my guess, he likely looked like a doctor, he acted like a doctor, uh, therefore people assumed that he was a doctor. And so cyber criminals can take advantage of this, this emotion uh, and exploit us as well if we're not careful. So with many social engineering attacks, there, there is a framework that is put into play. Uh, and this framework is, the, is a, basically a map or an attack plan that cyber criminals will use to exploit you. So let's look at uh, that framework and then we'll talk about a couple of examples with a variety of different attack mechanisms. So that first one is information, information gathering. Um, and so it, information gathering will vary based on the type of attack or the sophistication, uh, how targeted the recipient is. So in a more targeted attack, the cyber criminal will do more work to prepare to find out information. So OSINT, standing for Open Source Intelligence Gathering, is really just going out on the web and finding what information is available out there about them. Of course, as individuals and humans, uh, we have a lot of information that we voluntarily put out there about us, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, um, and maybe a few of you still maintain your MySpace pages, uh, but this information can be used against us. And in addition to the information that we voluntarily put out there about us, uh, about ourselves, there's also a lot of information out there that is done by other agencies, uh, by marketing firms, government. Um, and so a lot of information is available out there. And with a little bit of effort, a little bit of digging, uh, you can find out a lot about someone and you can use that to exploit them. Uh, so to that end, if we look at the next uh, kind of step in that social engineering framework, which is pretexting. So pretexting is just the practice of getting someone, um, presenting yourself as someone that you really aren't, right? So you're doing that in order to trick them to get that private information. Uh, so you might pretend to be someone's boss, uh, might pretend to be an authority figure, a, a doctor, law enforcement, 
a judge, something like that. Um, the IRS, for example, uh, can be a compelling uh, pretext. So once you've been able to take that information, present yourself as, um, as someone else, uh, then it comes the elicitation. So this is when you actually go out there and ask for the information. But the key with uh, cyber, uh, cyber attacks is to Yeah, I think uh, everyone, please just uh, stand by for a moment. Uh, this happens sometimes on Zoom. Hopefully you can still hear me. Dean is reconnecting. He's good. All right, I'm back. This is uh, apparently very popular with Zoom. Can you guys hear me now, Mark? Yeah, we can. All right, sorry about that. Um, all right, so in looking at the, uh, the elicitation where the act of getting information without directly asking for it. So um, I think the best way to illustrate this is actually with an interview that I saw on Jimmy Kimmel. So on Jimmy Kimmel, they were talking about cybersecurity and they sent someone out on the street to interview people. And in that interview, they asked people what their online passwords were. So here's the, this is the, the, how the interview went. Uh, they, they said, what is one of your uh, online passwords currently? Person answers, it's my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? A Chihuahua Papillion. And what's its name? Jameson. And where did you go to school? I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Hemville Area High School. When did you graduate? 2009. And that was the entire conversation. And now we know that the, dog, the, the girl's password is Jameson 2009. And it was just that easy. So they wanted to get the password, but they didn't directly ask them for the password. Instead, they went a, a securitist route to get the information to piece it back together. So all these social engineering efforts can lead, have many goals. Um, two of the goals that we would want you to focus on, be aware of are account takeovers. This is where cyber criminals use your access to uh, gain access to your accounts, to your financial accounts. Uh, and of course, ransomware, we've talked about a couple of those examples with JBS and Colonial Pipelines, uh, both of which can be catastrophic. And uh, we definitely want to be mindful and aware of those type of attacks. So let's look about, uh, let's look at three examples of how cyber criminals actually execute those attacks uh, and through different mediums. So we're going to talk about how uh, cyber criminals will attack over the phone, also known as a vishing attack, so voiced phishing attack. We'll talk about how cyber criminals will use this type of attack or use the medium of SMS or smishing. And then finally, we'll talk about how cyber criminals use email as a medium for attacks, which of course we all know is uh, phishing. So let's start with phone attacks, right? So as I mentioned, this is often commonly called vishing, so voice phishing, uh, where cyber criminal actually reaches out to get information from you. So this is actually based on a real world attack. Um, and uh, there's a link to the video that I'm referencing here uh, in the notes for the, the, uh, the slides that you'll get. So uh, in this uh, scenario, someone reached out and called a, a person and said that they were from Avast, Avast software. And due to some concerns with during COVID-19 and service interruptions, that they actually owed the person a refund. So that is the pretexting, right? So the information gathering was really just using ubiquitous information. Avast says there's something like 400 million people who use their software. And so it, there's a pretty good chance that um, you know, somebody you call could be using that software. And that's the uh, level of uh, information gathering they do. With that pretext done saying that they're from Avast and that they owe you a refund, uh, we go and take the next step of elicitation. So this is actually asking this person to do some, something. So in this case, what they actually did was they asked for the routing information for the, the person uh, so they could deposit their refund. Uh, they accidentally deposited too much money and called out panicking, called the person back panicking, saying that, hey, I accidentally did this. I need your help. Can you please help me recover this money? And so in order to help them recover the money, uh, they told them to download um, some remote 
uh, access software, uh, which then of course gave the cyber criminal access to the computer and allowed them to, over a few transfers, steal about two hundred thousand dollars worth, uh, two hundred thousand dollars. So it not all started with a simple question, a simple statement, a preface that, hey, I, I'm from Avast and I'm here to help you. What's interesting about vishing attacks is the fact that they can, uh, the caller can be very nimble, it can respond based on what you say, and can actually really tailor the conversation uh, to be very personalized based on, based on you, based on what they hear in the background, based on how you respond to encourage you or, or threaten you as needed to try to get you to do what they need, to, what, what you need them to do. So in the next example, the smishing attack or SMS attack, um, you know, information, information gathering can be pretty easy. So you know, going out into the web, you can find a lot of information out there about people. Facebook is a great uh, source for cyber criminals who actually want to target their victims. Uh, and we see attacks like this happen all the time. So you'll get a uh, text that, from someone you might know and it says, hey, uh, this is Courtney, I just got a no new phone. Uh, of course, you are glad to hear, you got the update. And then they ask, they, they take that next step and actually elicit you. So, I hate to bother you, I'm out of town and I got an accident, I'm okay, but I need $200 to get home, can you help me out? And so it can start with such a simple ask and by leveraging the familiarity you have with the person they're pretexting, uh, it can be a very compelling situation. Of course, emails, uh, you know, pretty common. Uh, I should say one, one quick note about uh, vishing attacks, excuse me, smishing attacks. Something that's interesting about smishing attacks is the uh, response rate that you get on a smishing attack. Research shows that 100%, almost 100% of uh, SMS uh, smish uh, sent actually get opened and about 50% of those actually get responded to. And so we have a very high response rate, which um, is a little bit different than our, our phishing emails. And so um, they, they, they are definitely something you need to be highly aware of and uh, you know, know how to respond and know how to spot them. Uh, email attacks uh, is another great way, of course, to get at, at all of your employees and uh, can be also pretty compelling because of convenience and because people have learned to trust their email. Um, our, you know, our email in many ways goes with us wherever we go, uh, whether we're at work, we're at the gym, we're, we're on the toilet, our email is there with us. And that's how much we trust our email. So many people often uh, trust their email too much. And so we need to have a little more skepticism. Um, in a, uh, in a, a simulated attack, uh, I had a, a client who asked me to target one of their executives. So it was a chief marketing officer for a, um, one of the top 100 largest hospitals in the US. And uh, so I went out and was able through social media to find that they had a Facebook page where they shared photos with their ex uh, ex-husband, um, and then they had a Facebook page that they used for their relationship, their dating, things of that nature. And I was able to pretty quickly correlate uh, information to figure out, um, you know, that where she was at certain times of the year, figure out where kids were at the same time of the year. In fact, at one point, she was, uh, I believe, in Cancun, Mexico, and her kids were actually staying with her ex-father-in-law, um, and uh, there were pictures of them making tents and, and being silly and things like that. Uh, very innocent stuff. And um, that information was able to be used against them. So I sent her, uh, I, I decided to pretend to be her, her ex-father-in-law. Uh, we'll call him Brian Mills for the sake of this example. And um, use that information along with the identity of Brian Mills uh, and send an email saying that, you know, remember the last time I kept the kids last summer when you were out of town in Cancun, being sure to drop enough information to legitimize myself. Um, and went on to say that I had a great idea when they were with me and just wanted to find, uh, for a gift for the kids, but just wanted to get your blessing and provide a simple link, sign the name, and that was it. And very quickly, uh, the recipient, the target of this, in this case, simulated phishing attack, uh, clicked the link in the email and was pretty furious about the whole thing um, and asked, you know, where did she get this information? Because it was fairly detailed information. And I simply sent back information to her Facebook page. And so to that end, this is one of the things that we need to be very aware of as a mechanism that can, uh, information that can be used against us. So to that end, uh, you know, if we're gonna take action to be able to defend ourselves against, the, against attacks, um, there are probably three different ways uh, that we'll, there are three different ways we'll focus on. There certainly are more. I know Mark will talk more about some of the, the security aspects of it. Uh, but when we talk about the, the people side of things, 
you know, one of the things that we should focus on is in, uh, our employee training. So the best way to prepare people for real world attacks is to actually simulate those attacks. And a, a employee should be um, presented with opportunities to learn, which really is what testing is, and the different type of attacks they'll face, whether that's uh, smishing, vishing, or phishing. And so I would encourage all of you to make sure you have a robust training program uh, to be able to spot these, have your employees spot these types of attacks. Of course, when it uh, comes to anything, whether it's reporting an email, email uh, whether it comes to asking questions about unusual requests, uh, you should always have an, uh, an open communication, an environment of open, open communication. You should encourage people to reach out. This is especially uh, important when it comes to financial controls. We often see people uh, getting emails uh, sent by a cyber criminal, pretending to be an executive, stating that they need something done immediately. This is urgent. And in an effort, because of their emotion, their desire to please, they act immediately and they make wire transfers that cannot be undone, um, all to the chagrin of the actual executive that was being impersonated. So having an open door communication, open communication where people can verify and validate and having strong policies for uh, signature level financial transactions all critical. When it comes to technological precautions, you know, I, this should be, you know, standard protocol for our business as well as a personalized, uh, being sure to use strong passwords, uh, make sure they're unique. Uh, of course, we don't want to store them in secure places like our browser, for example. Uh, using a uh, password manager is always better um, so that you can keep up with your passwords and keep them safe. Uh, using two-factor authentication is critical. That's one thing that uh, in my reading about the Colonial Pipeline breach, that the credentials that were used were for an account that had been deactivated. Well, it turns out that the way they logged in was with those credentials on an account that did not have two-factor authentication, which would have um, been a great barrier for that type of attack. Of course, keeping your network, your communications secure using a VPN whenever you're outside the network is also, uh, you know, great practice as well. And then personal controls, you know, think about your personal life and how you use information. Um, you know, so keep up with your financial accounts, of course, making sure you're getting regularly checking those accounts, uh, understanding the risk of social media and how they're used. And then be careful if you change your phone number. One thing that we have seen is that as people are uh, getting new phone numbers, they oftentimes aren't updating their accounts, um, authentication protocols where it sends that person a text. And so cyber, we have seen uh, studies where, you know, and this has been presented as a risk for cybersecurity and for cyber criminals. And so something to be mindful of as well, if you are updating your phone number, be sure to go into your account and uh, keep the contact information updated as well uh, so that you can be sure to get, uh, get any alerts on your accounts. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mark and uh, he will take us through a little bit more about the Fremont Bank security. All right, thank you, Dane, for that overview of the threat landscape. Um, let's see if I can share. Uh, yeah, Michelle, I think I need to be enabled for screen sharing here. So yeah, I, I see there's been a lot of questions in the chat. Thank you for those. I will try to uh, make sure that I talk about everything uh, there. Michelle, I still need access to share the screen. Um, you should have access now, Mike. Post disabled participant screen sharing. All right, let me try that again. So yeah, much of what I see in the, uh, the chat there, um, and I'll try to keep an eye on it as I'm talking. Um, I, I do plan to cover. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Here we go. Okay. So I'll be talking about what Fremont Bank does, uh, as I said earlier, um, to protect you as well as what you can do to protect yourself. Um, now, as some of the questions I, I saw there indicated, um, I think people are wondering how do we compare as a bank to other banks and how do we compare to other organizations like the one Dane uh, talked about uh, the meatpacking company, the pipeline company. Um, and, and I would say that we're intentionally 
much stronger in terms of cybersecurity than other organizations and even other banks. We've spent millions of dollars on our uh, cyber infrastructure to prevent breaches and account takeovers uh, because we consider it to be a very important part of the service that we provide you. Um, you know, we, we want your experience uh, with our bank to be safe and secure. Uh, now, I'm not going to cover uh, our internal technologies. I know there are questions about that. And again, if you looked in the chat, you saw that I encourage everybody to uh, email me, reach out to me directly. If you want to know what we're doing internally, I'm happy to share information about that. I'm going to be talking about the, the client facing services today. So uh, here's, here's some examples. Uh, first of all, we have a very advanced firewall. Uh, one that is uh, just emerged into the market uh, the last couple of years that gives us great visibility into um, attacks, attacks against our websites and our online banking. It also gives us the ability to block uh, geographies, geo-blocking, uh, which is something we do. And that's very important for you to be aware of. When we see countries, uh, we see attacks coming from countries uh, that are excessive and sophisticated, places like Russia, China, Iran, and many others, um, we just block that whole country. If you go there, you won't be able to access our online banking. So be aware of that. Um, and, and I want to tell you, if, uh, if you do plan a, a business trip or a vacation, you're, you're traveling to a different country, you should call us uh, to find out uh, if you'll be able to access your online banking. Um, for, for business clients, um, that's very important because you may need to make other arrangements while you're away. Uh, for consumer accounts, we do have options for people um, that are traveling. Again, you can call us. Um, the, uh, the, the advanced security that we have in place here is for our web servers. So that's the, uh, the uh, FremontBank.com website. Um, our mobile app is different. Mobile app works uh, everywhere. And on the website, we have uh, extended validation certificate, which means that you see the green bar at the top, you know that it's got an extra level of security. Um, I know there was a question about uh, credential stuffing and account takeover. Credential stuffing is where uh, attackers will use account names and passwords that they've picked up from uh, various breaches. And believe it or not, a lot of people still use the same password everywhere. Uh, so we do see attempts to uh, log into our clients' accounts uh, because they're using a password that has been previously breached. And I'm going to talk a little bit about multi-factor authentication as well, of course. But um, we have a, a, a type of uh, AI-based credential stuffing uh, protection, which basically detects, for example, if somebody's putting in a lot of usernames and passwords all very quickly, that's not normal. Right, and so uh, we put a stop to that from happening, um, and that's all relatively recent technology. Uh, another more advanced thing that we have is uh, is we can detect malware uh, and, and compromises on your computer, whether you're a business or consumer client. When you visit our website, uh, we have a tool that checks to see if you have a virus or a banking trojan. Uh, so that we can contact you and let you know that you're putting your account at risk because your computer is infected. Again, another relatively new technology uh, that we wanted to adopt to help protect you. Um, now, multi-factor authentication goes along with trusted devices. So if you log in for the first time from a computer or uh, a phone or a tablet, um, it'll, it'll challenge you with an extra code. Uh, but if you choose, to trust that device, then you won't get challenged in the future. That means that if a hacker is trying to take over your account, um, you know they'll. Uh, what will happen is the code will come to you, right? And you'll get a code that says, um, you know, here's your code for logging in. Now that uh, leads me to alerts. Uh, we have numerous alerts available, which I'm going to talk about, uh, so that you can be alerted when somebody uh, is trying to log into your account whether they succeed or fail. Um, so uh, we also have transaction limits. I'm sure you're familiar with transaction limits. Um, that is uh, basically allowing us to, um, you know, uh, to uh, control how much 
you're uh, either depositing or uh, sending out of your account. And uh, that way, if a fraudster is trying to drain your account, uh, that'll be an impediment to them. And on the back end, we have very sophisticated fraud detection. So uh, again, artificial intelligence base, it looks at your normal patterns of uh, account activity. And if something unusual comes across that you haven't done before, for example, a wire transfer to Hong Kong, uh, we will give you a call. And uh, the wire transfer to Hong Kong is something that uh, is, uh, it does happen. It does happen due to fraud. So um, as far as uh, on the consumer side, we have a, a number of these things and, and I've listed, you know, I just highlighted a few. Here's some more, um, you know, that we have in place. We do have uh, that advanced firewall I was talking about. We have our, um, our extended validation certificates on our web servers, multi-factor authentication, transaction limits, alerts. And this, uh, this thing called Verifin is our backend uh, fraud detection. Um, now, if, this is on the consumer side. And if you want to look at the, by way of comparison to the business online banking side, what you see is a lot more. We not only have additional layers uh, to protect business accounts, uh, but we also have uh, numerous options available to businesses that they can opt into. So, uh, so basically, uh, much it's basically a superset, much the same as what we have for uh, consumers. But in addition, we provide additional protection services to our business clients. Again, uh, I'm going to be sharing. We're going to be sharing all of this um, this material with you. So don't feel like you need to, um, you know, jot this down. Um, okay, I do want to go check the chat, but uh, yeah, that's very hard to do on Zoom while I'm presenting. So uh, I'll circle back to that. Let me talk about account alerts for a moment. Um, so we have a number of new alerts that are available to you uh, in the new online banking system. Um, and, and I think the alerts are very, very useful. I have all the alerts turned on on my accounts at the bank. Um, they let me know when I log in, which is reassuring because I know that it's me logging in. And they would let me know if somebody else was trying to log in or trying to change my password or trying to update my phone number in the system, uh, things like that. So uh, these alerts can be configured um, on the consumer side with our, our mobile app. So uh, here's a QR code that uh, if you want to like, you know, go take a look at it, you don't have the mobile app, you can turn on your, your phone's uh, camera, hold it up to that QR code, and it will say, if you want to open this, um, where it will take you then to uh, the account where you can set up alerts. So these are some alerts that we provide to our consumer clients um, and, and everybody gets these alerts. If you change your password, you're going to get an alert. And if you change your contact information, you'll get an alert. Um, and so forth, you're, you change your login ID, your username, um, you forgot your password, uh, change your alerts, uh, update your profile, or create a new user in your account. Those are built in. We also have optional alerts, which I recommend everybody turn on all the alerts. You might as well, because you're gonna, it's, it's gonna pelt you with information when you're logging into your account, but that's okay, right? It's something that you're expecting. Uh, it's not that much of a distraction. Um, external transfers, I think are very important. So if you're transferring money out of your account, you'll get an alert saying there was a transfer. Um, and, uh, you know, or adding a, an external account for a transfer uh, when a new device is registered and uh, when somebody uh, gets the password wrong, that do does happen. Uh, you know, people are trying to log into accounts, again, using those compromised passwords. And so if they put in the wrong password, you'll get the alert that somebody's trying to log into your account. Uh, the valid password one is just yet another way to see yourself logging in, uh, unless by some chance your password is compromised and somebody else logs in. Uh, you'll get the code for MFA, but you'll also get this alert and you can contact us. Um, 
if somebody resets the password, there's an alert for that. And uh, the secure access code, that's the uh, multi-factor authentication. You can get an alert for that as well. Okay, let me pause for a moment there and see if I can get over to uh, the chat. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the QR code is partially, that's okay. Um, you, you'll have, as soon as we're done here today, we're gonna send you this, uh, this material and you'll have the QR code in it. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions right now. So I'm gonna keep an eye, try to keep an eye on the chat while I'm talking in case uh, somebody has an additional question. Okay, there's more information here. We've included a couple of links for you to resources on our um, website so that you can go uh, find out more about these things. Um, and on a previous slide, I also had a link to our, uh, our fraud center where you can find a lot more information as well. Okay, so I wanted to include this information. Again, this is uh, on the consumer side. We don't have a mobile app capability for businesses, but on the consumer side, uh, people ask me all the time, is, is a mobile app safe? Is it safe to use? Um, the fact is that it is safer. The mobile app is safer than uh, using the website. Uh, it has additional security capabilities that the websites uh, don't have. So uh, let me explain why. Uh, first of all, you probably have a biometric capability on your phone. Uh, this one here has face ID. Uh, previous phones I've had used you know, the fingerprint touch ID, um, which is an additional, uh, not only an additional layer of security, but uh, it's better security because passwords, as we all know, are inherently a poor way to identify somebody because basically anybody who has the password can claim to be you, right? If they get your password somehow through phishing, as Dean was talking about, social engineering, a breach, or some kind of malware on your computer, um, that's why we have multi-factor authentication because passwords are uh, a very poor way to identify people. Biometrics, by comparison, is much stronger. This face ID has been well tested. Uh, it's it's very difficult, if not impossible, to impersonate somebody's face successfully. And likewise with the fingerprints, yes, there are uh, you know side cases where uh, researchers have been able to potentially get past that using various tricks. But generally speaking, attackers are going for the easy targets. And those easy targets are generally uh, stealing passwords. So using a phone is better uh, for that reason. Another reason is uh, malware, banking trojans. You've probably heard a lot about banking trojans. Uh, they're specifically designed malware that's uh, intended to, uh, to intercept your uh, banking credentials and allow attackers to then log in to your bank account. Now, uh, certainly it's true that there are banking Trojans and malware on phones as well, but they're much less common. And the reason for that is typically because you have a computer, I have a computer here I'm sitting in front of, um, that maybe other people are using too, and you don't know what they're doing. You don't know what websites they're visiting. You don't know what malware might be on there. Uh, it's completely invisible to you. So you go, you go here and you uh, log in to your online banking on, on your home computer. Uh, you don't know if it's safe. Whereas a phone is always in your possession, right? It's always in your field of view. You know where it is. You know what's happening to it. You know what people are doing with it, which is why I say it makes it safer. Uh, and, and so uh, one thing I recommend, you know, basically computers are risky. Computers... Uh, um, you know, many of us have to use a computer. That's our way of connecting to the internet. Um, but uh, if you're doing your banking, especially for a business, especially if you have a significant amount of money at stake, we highly recommend that you use a dedicated computer for your banking, just used for banking only, not used for any other web surfing, any other activities. Um, so that it, it becomes more like a phone in that respect, that it's, uh, it's something that you're, you're aware of what's going on with that device. And uh, generally speaking, as far as malware on, on phones go, um, you're a lot safer 
if you're downloading apps from official sources than you would be if you're going to unofficial app stores. Okay. Let me just uh, pause there again to check the chat. Okay. Come back to that in a minute. All right, so I'm just moving on to my last topic here and then I'll circle back to any additional questions. Um, and, and so this is just a, a soapbox moment for me. I, I, this is something that I, I want to take the opportunity since I have the floor to, uh, to tell you what I think is something that is one of the most important things you can do to protect your family. Okay, this is on a personal level. Uh, social security numbers have been widely breached over the last several years. So uh, pretty much all of our social security numbers are available for purchase on the dark net. Um, and, and scammers use the social security number as the single anchor for, uh, for uh, impersonating your identity, okay? Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, this can result in tax refund scams. It can result in uh, attempts to impersonate you to your bank and to uh, other entities and it can lead to uh, credit fraud. So how can you protect yourself from credit fraud and your children uh, and your family? Well, the most important thing, in my opinion, professionally, that you can do is place a freeze on your credit. You've probably heard about this, and maybe you have one. I do. My whole family does. Um, it, it basically means that uh, nobody can open up a new line of credit under your identity specifically tied to that social security number. So this is how you stop people from uh, opening up a line of credit and then not paying it and then your credit getting ruined or your children who may not even have a credit history yet, um, you know, if they can get that social security number, they could start up a line of credit that will then uh, stain your child's reputation for many years. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about more about credit freezes. Um, there's some other things you could do and you've probably heard this LifeLock LifeLock is a good product, you know, if, if you want to, uh, to have a little more visibility into sort of real time, real time activity uh, on your credit report, um, you do have to pay for it. You can get credit reports for free uh, from three of the credit bureaus, uh, free once a year. And what we recommend there is that um, if you want this, Get your, get your credit report from one bureau and then wait, do it again four months later from a different bureau and again four months later from a third bureau and you can get three credit reports a year. Um, I'm not a big fan of this myself because uh, they're, they're hard to read. They're very lengthy. Uh, it doesn't really tell you at a glance what you want to know. So there is MyFICO, which is another service to, to do monitoring. The difference though, if you look at the first item here, place a freeze on your credit is a preventive measure it stops credit fraud from happening. The, the other three items here are detective measures. They let you know when fraud has occurred. So credit freeze is, uh, is, is what I recommend for everybody. I have my credit frozen, as I said. Now, I recently, a couple years ago, bought a new car and I got a loan to, uh, to pay for that. So what I had to do is while I was sitting in the uh, dealership and they were looking at my credit, they knew exactly what was going on because everybody's freezing their credit these days ever since the Equifax breach. So I logged into the, uh, the website, which I have listed for you here um, for each of those bureaus, logged in. Uh, I put in this special number that they give you when you freeze your credit. It's a, a 10 or 12 digit uh, number. And, uh, and I told them how long I want my credit to be uh, available for, for this purchase. Uh, I also did a refinance on a home. And, and what, what I learned is that uh, if you do this, if you lift a security freeze that you had in place, you probably want to lift it for several days because they're going to come back. So your lender is going to come back and recheck your credit. So if you want to avoid an additional phone call, an additional um, unfreeze, then uh, you, know, you should uh, uh, just tell, you tell it, start, unfreeze it on this day, freeze it again on this day. 
It's actually a very simple process. As long as you have that number they give you when you're freezing, you absolutely need to keep that number in a safe place. I'm actually recommending that you put it in an iPhone note, um, which are relatively secure. There's a balance here between securing this piece of information, this pin number that you need to uh, open up your credit versus uh, uh, being able to get it when you need it, right? And when you need it, you really wanna be able to get it. Uh, with that said, lifting the security freeze is very easy. I've given you the uh, instructions here um, for each of the four, four credit bureaus. Most people are familiar with three, the big three, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Uh, not everyone knows that there is a fourth credit bureau in Novus. And so uh, you wanna freeze your credit there as well because otherwise a savvy scammer can uh, just go to a Novus and uh, use that uh, or find a, basically find a lender that uses a Novus and uh, use that to, uh, to perform credit fraud. Okay, that said, let me go back to the, uh, the chat and see what's going on over here. Ah, okay, great question. Um, so when you place a freeze on your credit, what it really boils down to is that uh, uh, a lender cannot pull your, your credit report, cannot pull your, your credit score and your credit report. And they can't proceed any further with creating a new line of credit, whether it's a, a credit card or a home loan or an auto loan or a boat loan or any other kind of loan. They're basically stopped because they can't access your credit report. That's essentially how it works. Um, it certainly absolutely does. No, okay. It, it would prevent you from opening a new line of credit, whether that's a credit card or a loan. Um, you can't open a new line of credit while the freeze is in place because your lender is not going to be able to pull your credit report. Um, it does not have anything to do with using your existing lines of credit, credit cards, HELOCs, home loans, anything that you might have that's a line of credit. Um, if you already have it, the freeze doesn't affect that. It's only for brand new lines of credit, which is why it's so important for preventing uh, identity fraud uh, and credit fraud. Okay, I don't see any other questions here at the moment. Let me give you uh, a few seconds if, you, if you're thinking about typing something in. Um, what I wanna do though, is I really wanna emphasize that uh, we've, we've tried to cover some, uh, some high level information for you. Hopefully you find some of it useful. My hope is that you will uh, have learned something or at least become aware of a current scam that uh, you can tell your family about. And maybe by telling your family, if they get one of these phone calls Dane was talking about or text messages, um, they'll think twice before responding to that. So please do share this information. Um, I see a couple more questions coming in. Uh, as far as uh, LifeLock, uh, no, LifeLock is just a monitoring service. It's just gonna notify you. Um, it's pretty much not gonna do anything if you have a freeze on your credit because it would tell you about changes to your credit uh, and especially you know new lines of credit being opened up which can't happen if you have a freeze. So it's a little bit redundant. Um, I don't have LifeLock. I have a credit freeze in place uh, for myself and my family. I see Eric, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, that's one that I was hoping somebody would ask. Since Dane mentioned password managers, um, I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple things about password managers. First of all, uh, I highly recommend and I use password managers. I've used them for a number of years. When I talk to people about password managers, uh, there's a couple of things that they express concern about. First of all, um, isn't having all your passwords in one place risky? Because then a hacker just needs to go to your password vault to get your password. Well, uh, the answer is no, it's not risky. It's certainly not as risky as that Excel spreadsheet I know all of us have somewhere, right? Or a piece of paper with those passwords on them. Um, uh, because it's encrypted and uh, it's secure. How do we know it's secure? Because these companies have been around for long enough. Their whole business model is based on keeping 
those passwords secure. Um, now, uh, I recommend Dashlane. Dashlane, if you uh, have a family and you want to keep it simple, easy to use, Dashlane uh, is very intuitive. That's what I use and my family uses. Um, again, so let me let me uh, just have a little disclaimer here. Uh, this is just me talking to you at this point. This is not a bank recommendation. This is just my recommendation. Uh, Dashlane is, is easy to use for families. Uh, and it, it's uh, $20 a year, unless the price has gone up, but I think it's 20 bucks a year uh, to be able to use it on multiple, all your devices. Phones, it works on the phone. If you're going to a website on the phone, it'll put in the password for you. Um, on the computer, it'll put in the password for you. Uh, it, Dashlane is great. There's another one that I recommend called LastPass, which is more feature rich, but uh, it's also less intuitive. So if you're more technically inclined, you might prefer LastPass. But if you like ease of use, you might prefer Dashlane. Uh, another thing that people are concerned about with, with password managers is how, how do you get all your passwords in there, right? Uh, I, I've been using Dashlane for a number of years and I can tell you I have almost 350 passwords. And that's not unusual. I don't have uh, accounts that you don't have. I have Facebook and Gmail and LinkedIn and my bank accounts and everything else in there. And there's 350 of them. Uh, how do you get them all in there? Well, uh, it puts them in for you. The minute you log in, it'll put, put the password in. It'll ask you if you want to put the password in the vault. So it's very, very easy to populate that vault. Um, and the nice thing about a password manager is that it then allows you to have a different password everywhere because you don't even need to know your password. I don't know any of my passwords. They're all completely random, completely randomly generated by the password manager. The only password I need to know is the one password that gets me into Dashlane. Now, another concern people have while I'm on the subject is, uh, well, what if you forget your Dashlane password, right? Now what happens? You're locked out of all your accounts. No, because every website has a password reset capability. If that ever happens or Dashlane gets the wrong password for some reason, no big deal. Just go click forgot password, change the password. It's that easy. <laughs> Mia, thanks. Uh, what if that uh, Excel spreadsheet is password protected? You know, um, Excel password protection has gotten a lot better over the years, but uh, it's still not great. Um, there are tools that can crack it. Uh, sure, if it's uh, if it's uh, isolated at a well-defined perimeter, it's probably okay, but why not just use a password manager? It's a lot easier. It really is uh, very easy. I recommend you can just go try it. If you're hesitant about a password manager, um, try it out, see what you think. Um, and again, you can email me. Uh, my email is is there in the chat and my email address is also in the, uh, the slides. Um, I'm more than happy to give you advice just on a personal level. Uh, okay. So I think I'm going to pull up here and give Chris an opportunity to tell us about our prize winners today, as well as thank you. And I want to thank you all for spending your time with us today. I hope that some of this was helpful. I hope we'll see you again in future sessions. And I'm more than happy to, uh, you know, to accommodate any outreach. Uh, so thank you. And Chris, you want to go ahead and wrap us up? I'll wrap us up. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, Dane. Um, I have confirmed that there were 90 um, of our uh, great clients attended today and hope you all got something out of that. I will say Mark is serious about uh, if you contact him, he will um, provide um, answers and help and listen to you. Um, his wife just asked that you don't invite him out for drinks afterwards right at this point in time. So <laughs> um, that's not true. But we, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, uh, we're really happy to put this on for all of you. Um, and, um, and there were some great questions there and I, I allowed Mark to answer them because he is our expert on it. Um, one thing I do want to say is Fremont Bank is exceptionally safe for our customers and your data. Um, the one thing that we pride ourselves on is that you trust us um, to keep your data and your funds um, safe and sound. Um, and we take great pride in that. And uh, we've put a great program in place um, in order to do that. I can say we've never had a breach um, 
Mark's kill chain will um, prevent any potential that may come up. Um, we've invested a lot um, in this because we know the future of banking and the future of your trust rests with not having uh, any loss of data or loss of funds. So thank you, uh, we appreciate it. Um, of the 90 of you um, that got put in the hat, we have uh, three prize winners today. Um, the first prize is a wine tour basket. So a basket with wines, cheeses, crackers, things like that. Um, and our first prize winner today is Liz Weinblatt. Um, Liz Weinblatt, are you on there? And uh, so we, we uh, and I'm gonna announce your name three times. That's our, uh, our protocol. So, <laughs> so Liz Weinblatt, you are our uh, wine basket winner. Um, the second drawing is for um, a day of sailing um, on Fremont Bank sailboat out in San Francisco Bay. Our captain is Mike Moran. Um, I believe he is on the website today. Um, and uh, uh, he's a great, a great captain. He can get in and out really, really great. And he uh, gives a great tour out there. Um, ask him to ensure he's got the uh, Trader Joe's uh, salmon plate ready on the boat for you so um so uh, number two that prize uh the winner today is walt Facil facilis jr so walt facilis jr you are our winner for um a day on the fremont bank boat um so walt facilis you are that winner. <laughs> thank you you're welcome <laughs> That's great. Um, we will be, um, by the way, Fremont Bank will be in touch with each of these winners for how to uh, get the price to you or to how to arrange for the boat, Walt. Um, Mike Moran will tell you how many guests you can bring along with you. Um, and um, our grand prize winner, um, and this is a great prize. So uh, Fremont Bank has a home um, down in Pebble Beach um, on Los Altos Drive. Um, you can literally walk to the coast from uh, this particular house across the Monterey Peninsula golf course. Um, and so this is a two night romantic stay at our Fremont Bank Los Gatos house. And that prize winner is, drum roll, Charlotte Smith. So Charlotte Smith, you are our grand prize winner. And uh, I hope that you have a great trip down there. Um, we will get everything arranged for you, Charlotte Smith. See, I said it three times. I tried, I worked that up. <laughs> um, but Charlotte, you're going to love it. We just remodeled that home. Um, it's an absolutely fabulous place um, to spend a little time. So uh, thank you. And thank everybody again for attending today. Um, we really appreciate your business. Um, it's always a great day at Fremont Bank as long as you stay with us and continue your relationship. So with that, I am going to sign off. Uh, I am, by the way, that helicopter is in the Grand Canyon behind me. That's uh, my son's helicopter. He flies down here in Las Vegas. So it's uh, 103 today, a great cool day in Las Vegas. <laughs> um, so thanks again. We appreciate, uh, appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.